we as clinicians, when we see patients, we are very often, I think most often, we are engaged in a research domain criteria ba uh, approach. In other words, I don't think most psychiatrists or nurse practitioners or, or family doctors, uh, physician assistants, depends which, uh, where, where we are, I don't think people are that held ransom to the DSM-5 typology. We have to have a diagnostic criteria. We need a common language, a lingua franca. We need to have the diagnosis established. At the same time, informally, it's my impression that many, if not most clinicians, are treating symptom dimensions or symptom domains. So for example, sleep disturbance or anxiety or problems with feeling flat, lack of motivation or reward disturbance. And by now, I'm sure most of you have at least heard of the research domain criteria, which is a, a typology, a, a kind of a framework that is meant to provide for us a um, way of categorizing the finite number of ways that brain disease may manifest. So we talk about negative valence disturbances, known on the street as threat. We talk about positive valence disturbances, which is a disturbance in the reward valuation, reward response, reward learning. So anhedonia would be the catch-all phrase, although anhedonia doesn't quite do it justice. We talk about general cognitive processes. We talk about social cognition. And we talk about chronobiology or sleep. Last week, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to three researchers who discovered the clock gene. So chronobiology has made a resurgence, if you will, in the area of science. The point is, is whether we're talking about schizophrenia or autism, OCD, major depression, you pick the organism, you can actually disassemble that organism from a phenomenological perspective and probably from a neurobiological perspective and place it in one or more of these five domains. In my view, I think the research domain criteria, which the NIH, Tom Insull was the one who led this, is probably the most important uh, adv advance that we've seen in terms of uh, thinking about the framework of psychopathology in many, many decades. So it starts off with that because there's been a lot of interest in developing new treatments. We have a paradigm strain in terms of mechanistic models. What we also have is we have a diagnostic manual that has very modest, at best, inter-observer agreement. Said differently, experts in psychiatry, when they're in the same room, and a person's on the stage with depression or bipolar disorder, the degree of agreement that exists amongst colleagues as to what that diagnosis is, is very modest. And then when you add to that how to define response or remission, we have tremendous problems with agreement. This is in part, by the way, why genetic testing for depression or trying to pick a treatment based on genetic testing has turned out to be quite underwhelming so far. But it's also something critical, and that is, is that we're trying to find what is the right treatment at the right dose for the right patient. Now, you don't need to have a degree in science to engage in a bit of Socratic reasoning. If we don't really have a lot of agreement on what the diagnosis looks like a lot of the time, and depression phenotypes is where we really don't agree very much, whether it's part of bipolar disorder or unipolar, we have a lot of differences on what response is even defined as, then how good is it to look at predictors of response to a conventional treatment defined on DSM-5? So I think a high school educated person would say, that doesn't sound very sound. So the point is, is we need to have a phenotype that we agree on. We need to have a phenotype that's replicable. We need a phenotype that has a well sussed out neurobiological substrate. And the additional offering of the RDOC, in addition to giving us a very new language, this convergent phenomenological language, is that the underlying substrates, that is the substrates that subserve this phenomenology, are well characterized. 
So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about obesity in diabetes. Everyone knows that patients with mood disorders are differentially affected. That was news 20 years ago. That's not the news today. We all know that. That's been supported by ample clinical and epidemiological data. The future is going to be about trying to use this information to preempt, to prevent the disease, as well as inform the model so that we can, in fact, intervene with very novel approaches. You're looking at data from an initiative that has been established between our team in Toronto and China. And this is a sample of young people who are at high risk of bipolar disorder. Now, in the world of high risk, there's two types of high risk. There's high risk and there's ultra high risk. So high risk means your parent, both or one or the other, has bipolar. Ultra high risk means that Yes, you have a parent with bipolar, parent or parents, but in addition, you're also manifesting psychopathology of some sort, but it's nonspecific. So in other words, you're kind of knocking on the door. And what we found was, in this young group, largely adolescents, when we conducted MRI scans, we did neurocognitive testing, a variety of tests on them in terms of peripheral markers, we found that the brain of people who are at high risk of bipolar disorder looked in some ways different, but in a lot of ways similar to healthy controls. But when we ran the data looking at obesity in those at risk versus healthy controls, we found that the brain of the high risk or ultra high risk started to look a little different. In some regions, the brain was bigger. In some regions, the brain was smaller. And we can get lost in those weeds as to what that may or may not mean, which is largely conjecture. But the point is, is that there was something about obesity that was interacting with the at-risk changing brain morphometry. And that's not without interest, because we also know from other lines of research that obesity in a mood population is not just common. That was news 20 years ago. But it seems to, in fact, be changing the phenomenology of the illness. Everyone knows that smoking, I guess, except Justin, that smoking cannabis <laughs> is dangerous to your brain. And when you smoke cannabis as a 15-year-old, you disrupt endogenous cannabinoids, known as 2-AG and endandamide. And this is the hypothe hypothetical framework as to why smoking cannabis at age 15 is potentially deleterious to you. It seems as though if you're obese at age 15, of which most of these people were, that seems to be also changing your brain, increasing the likelihood that you're going to declare bipolar disorder. Now, we've all heard that in depression, bipolar schizophrenia, the major reason the major mediator of outcome is cognition. Bipolar is a cognitive disorder that also has mania and depression. And the cognitive disturbances are what drives the PRO, the patient reported outcome. And the cognitive disturbances of bipolar are transdiagnostic. They're not specific to bipolar. They cut across the entire DSM-5 categories. One of the ways that you can strategically begin to unravel the pathogenesis of cognitive impairment of disease X is by looking at a similar phenotype, that is disease Y, and drilling down, cascade down, and try to find out what's subserving that cognitive problem, and can that crosstalk or can that cross-pollinate and illuminate disease X? So diabetes type 2 and type 1 is a cognitive disorder. People are living longer with diabetes. People are living shorter if you have bipolar, which is appalling. But people are living longer with diabetes, which means that the long-term exposure effects on brain are becoming more apparent. People who have diabetes type 2 and type 1, but type 2 is on the slide. This is a meta-analysis that's in press exhibit cognitive impairments that are qualitatively and quantitatively a lot like what we see in, in bipolar, in major depression. Now, just to be sort of pithy about this, to be very brief, this gives reasons to believe that the substrate 
may be similar. And we know that diabetes is a disturbance of metabolism and a disturbance of inflammation. Anhedonia is a, a conflation of many different constructs. There's about half a dozen constructs that make up anhedonia. The wanting of something and the liking of something are very different. The wanting of something is largely dopamine. The liking of something is largely opiate, cannabinoid, as well as incretin. And when you look at measures of pleasure in people who have diabetes, like cognition, anhedonia is highly, highly linked to impaired glucose regulation. In my experience as a psychiatrist, the biggest challenge I have from a phenomenological perspective is treating anhedonia and treating cognitive impairment. And I don't think I'm alone. Patients are flat. There's no pleasure. And in bipolar, because of the problems with reward, they engage in abnormal reward behaviors, such as gambling, sex, drugs, alcohol, and food. Anhedonia is a transdiagnostic construct that seems in many ways to be influenced by inflammation and by impairment in metabolism. In neuroscience, we love bad math. One plus one does equal 10 in neuroscience. We just finished a study, the biggest ever, ever done in the workplace, looking at diabetes. And the question was, what is the effect of diabetes and mood disorder on the workplace. So to keep this brief, we conducted a screener of the Canadian workplace. We had almost 4,000 people participate in this survey. And you all know that people who have diabetes type 2 have higher rates of major depression and bipolar. And we looked at this, and we found that people who have diabetes, they have impairments in work, not just absenteeism, but presenteeism. I'm there in corpus, but I'm not there in mentis. They also have problems with depression and cognition. It turns out that when we run the analysis in the Canadian workplace, the reason, not reasons plural, the reason why diabetics report decreases in workplace performance is not because they're depressed. It's because they're cognitively impaired. And we had ways of measuring that. And it turns out that when you take cognition out of the equation, depression didn't account for a whole lot of their workplace impairment. So as clinicians, we see people who have bipolar, major depression, obesity, diabetes. And patients don't function at a level that they should and they want to. And so it stands to reason that treating and preventing physical health manifestations makes good sense. It makes good sense from many different perspectives, but how often do we think about it, it makes good sense from the workplace performance perspective, from the day-to-day -day psychosocial perspective? And from an actuarial perspective, this is where the money's at in terms of trying to get people to improve the role function, particularly given this human capital economy that we currently exist in. So let's, in fact, now just kind of turn and go in a slightly different direction. We start off by saying that, and I've completely not covered the entire literature on the overlap of metabolic and inflammatory conditions and mood, because everyone knows that. I want to, in fact, take the conversation where we should be going, and that is role impairment. What does this mean for brain outcomes? What does this mean for potential mechanistic models, and how can this shape what we can do so we can do things very differently, not just in the future, but also in the short term clinically. Let me show you some other examples of molecular or cellular convergence. I've always been struck by the fact that bipolar patients and depressed patients who are obese are more likely to exhibit anhedonia, and they're more likely to evince cognitive impairment. And there's not one simple point of convergence. Um, there's many points of convergence. And on this slide, this is something I've 
taken from the research domain criteria, when you're focusing on an area, you've got different units of analysis ranging from the macro through the meso to the micro. And I'm going to just pick up on a couple of these cellular and molecular overlaps. Mother Nature has given us a monoamine oxidase inhibitor called insulin. Insulin is parnate. So monoamine oxidase enzymes are expressed on the outer mitochondrial membrane. And under normal circumstances, insulin reduces the expression of Mayo A and B. In states of insulin resistance, what occurs is, is that the monoamine oxidase activity grows like a weed. It's not being inhibited. Consequently, you have increased turnover of dopamine and norepinephrine. This is why people who have diabetes evince so much anhedonia and so much depression and so much cognitive impairment. It's also in part why persons with bipolar and depression who have obesity and diabetes are more likely to manifest a depression-prone, anhedonia-prone, cognitively impaired-prone illness but through this mechanism of insulin. Now, you all know by now that multi-episode mood disorder links to cognitive impairment. With each episode, there's a stepwise drop in cognitive performance. That's one set of privileges of recurrent illness. The other privilege of, rec of recurrent illness is the hazard for Alzheimer's goes up. So there's this monotonic increase in Alzheimer's as a function of each episode of illness. Insulin is well known in terms of its role in glucoregulatory function, Banting and Best. Eli Lilly gave them a grant, and in 1921, they did the first study at the Toronto General Hospital in patients, and they reported it out. The last 10 years has seen a massive increase in the role of insulin in brain. This is the most exciting, most illuminating area of neuroscience in the last 10 years, is the link between metabolism and the brain. And insulin is not just there in the brain for the purpose of glucose, because we don't need insulin in the brain for glucose. It's directly uptake by the cells, the neurons and glia. The reason why insulin is there is to help shape the structure and the function of the brain at the cellular level, but also if you get into the molecules, it turns out that insulin reduces amyloid. It reduces hyperphosphorylation of tau. And these two proteins, amyloid and tau, are implicated in Alzheimer's disease. And what's interesting is that with each episode of mood disorder, you see greater insulin resistance. With each episode of mood disorder, you see more cognitive impairment. And with each episode of mood disorder, you see more Alzheimer's disease. So this is something that has clinical overlap and clinical implications, but you can see where this is going, how this is beginning to shape and shed light on some prevention opportunities here. Now, leptin is an adipocyte. It's a protein that's produced by your fat cells. Insulin is largely produced in the islets and the pancreas. And they are dopamine proteins. I already talked about insulin and its relationship with Mayo. Leptin, under normal circumstances, tells you to stop eating when you've had enough to eat or your body's energy replenishment has reached its point. And there's lots of evidence now that leptin, which is one of the metabolic peptides, is about 30 or 40, in insulin, which is a well-known peptide, are related to ventral tegmental area activity. So the reward circuitry involves nodal structures like the ventral tegmental area, the substantia nigra, the nucleus accumbens, and specifically the islets of Kaleha. And we know that these systems, these reward nodes, and these reward circuits are engaged by these metabolic peptides. The bipolar population and the unipolar population suffer from terrible reward, which we call anhedonia. They have terrible problems with cognition, which is related to dopamine, and terrible problems with depression, which is related to dopamine. 
Now, not all pathways lead to dopamine, but I'm trying to show you how these different effector systems interrelate. Now, if I asked you the following question, I'll give you $5 if you, in fact, do something right now. But if you can wait for two hours, I'll give you $500. I think most would say, let's wait two hours. We, in fact, call that discounting. In other words, I'm going to discount the temptation of the short-term fix for the long-term gain. That's a paradigm that's used to measure reward. People who have reward disturbances are more likely to say, give me the five bucks now, as opposed to the 500 bucks two hours from now. And what's really interesting, that reward discounting paradigm, which has been validated and used in this area, has been shown, in fact, to be abnormal in bipolar disorder. Your, your patients with bipolar, if you ask them, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, you want five bucks now or 500 bucks five hours from now? You know what they're going to say, give me the money now. That's not the right answer. The right answer is wait. It turns out that if you look at diabetics and you look at insulin resistance, the line going up is good news. The line going down is bad news. So less discounting is good. It turns out that if you're insulin resistant, you're more likely to say, I want the money now. That's a problem with reward function. So I'm saying to you that at the molecular level, there's an effect of insulin and the metabolic system on dopamine. We already know it's affecting cellular and circuit levels. But the behavioral level, that is reward behavior, we're beginning to see this manifestation apparent in the laboratory paradigm. But it's already manifesting itself in the clinical ecosystem with people exhibiting depression, anhedonia, and cognitive impairment. There's been a plethora of studies that have been published in this field in the last 10, 15 years now looking at brain diabetes interface. And you're going to hear that the brain looks different in people who have obesity and diabetes. I started off this presentation by showing you ultra-high-risk people who have a different brain morphometry as a function of BMI, body mass index. But what I didn't tell you is what I'm going to tell you right now. And that is there's no correlation between insulin resistance in the periphery and in the central region. And there's no evidence that central insulin resistance relates to peripheral or vice versa. So we're making a huge inferential leap. So one of the paradigms which we are developing with folks at NIH is to look at a, what's called exosomes. And exosomes are small little bags that are floating in your blood that have been actually derived from your brain. And these little bags are just almost imagine you're, uh, just imagine you're, you're, you're making a pie. And you've just made a crust for the pie, your apple pie. And as you're making the pie on that foil, there's a little leftover dough. That little leftover is just pushed aside. Those are the exosomes, and they kind of float around your blood. And on the surface of these exosomes, there's proteins. And those proteins include serine, and serine tells us about insulin resistance. And so it's been shown in Alzheimer's disease, of which 80% of patients with Alzheimer's disease are insulin resistant, it turns out that these individuals' exosomes are very different. We now know that exosomes in the periphery reflect central activity. So we're making a huge inferential leap, but just at an experimental level, we now have this technology. We can look at the brain's insulin resistance without actually having to put our finger in your brain to take your blood and use this technology called exosomes. Now, we've moved away from these kind of notions that you got too much or too little serotonin. That was a great meme. We've moved away from you know, the hippocampus being too small and depression. That was a great meme 10 years ago. We now talk about a more integrated model of circuits and networks and nodes. CNN, circuits, nodes, and networks, but also fake news. But circuits, nodes, and networks, and fake news. And so we have these circuits, nodes, and networks. And what's really occurring in the brain is what we call topology. There's something wrong with the functional connectivity of the brain. That's the topology. That's the quantitative metric. 
And using various analytical techniques, you can look at that functional interconnectivity. Now this slide is attempting to make the case that when you look at brain activity, and in this case what we're looking at in this slide is brain activity in discrete regions, the orbital frontal cortex, implicated in reward, that insulin will affect the activity in a brain region, we call that a node or a seed, but also it'll affect the functional interconnectivity. And that's the, that's the lesion, is that functional interconnectivity. So major depression and bipolar are functional connection syndromes. And those functional connectivity abnormalities are a consequence of the anatomical alterations that exist in the white matter and the gray matter collectively. So we looked at molecules, said a few words about cells, I showed you the paradigm and the behavior, now we're going to look at th these circuits. And this is really interesting because we're trying to figure out how can we reset these circuits. So your motherboard on your computer doesn't work at home, you call the geek squad, they come to your house, they fix your computer, they reset the circuit. And that's what we're trying to do with our interventions and prevention strategies. I asked a question about sirtuins. Sirtuins are known on the street as histone deacetylase inhibitors. And these deacetylases are involved in epigenetics. So that nature-nurture interface molecularly is called epigenetics. And we know that these proteins are involved in cell aging as well as inflammation and metabolism. And bipolar and depression are examples of cellular aging. We also know that they're involved in metabolism of the cell, in inflammation of the cell. And what's interesting is that if you take animals or humans and you look at sirtuins and there's seven isoforms, you see differences in the expression of these proteins. One in six to be specific. Details are not the point, but the point is, is that here's this protein family implicated in cellular aging, metabolism, and inflammation that is abnormal in states of stress. And this is an animal paradigm, ESI stress. We're going to come back to this when I talk about the translational data in just a moment. Incretins are proteins that are involved in glucose regulation. Now, everyone knows insulin. Incretins are released by your bowel, the L cells in your intestine, and they act as insulin secretagogues. In addition, these proteins are in your brain, the nucleus tractus solitarius, to be specific. And you could be saying, why do I care? Well, because we're in the brain preservation business, and these proteins are involved in brain preservation. Moreover, at your local convenient retail drugstore, there are incretin-based drugs. A drug called Victoza is a drug for diabetes, which is an exogenous synthetic incretin. And we know from many lines of research that incretins are preserving brain function. Hold that thought for a moment. The longer you're exposed to high sugar, as bipolar patients and depressed patients are, the more likely they exhibit cognitive impairment, anhedonia, and depression, and the more likely they exhibit alterations in CNN. Here's one of the nodal structures, the hippocampus in rats, showing that if you're a depressed rat, your hippocampus begins to shrink. If you're a diabetic rat, your hippocampus begins to shrink. One plus one equals 10. If you're depressed and diabetic, you get even more shrinkage. So you can see how this is coming together in terms of what this means. And when you look at that functional connectivity in diabetics, what we see is exactly what we see in bipolar and depression. There's something wrong with this reciprocity, what I call the SIR, the segregation, the integration, the reciprocity in the brain networks. This was a study that looked at the superior longitudinal fasciculus, the uncinate fasciculus, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, different brain regions and structures showing that diabetics, there's something wrong with their circuitry that looks very, very similar to what we see in bipolar and depression. This is a study from a colleague in Halifax, Thomas Hayek, showing that some of the brain structural changes that they observed in their bipolar patients 
were moderated by insulin in the periphery. But then I have to also say that periphery does not actually reflect central. But the point is, is that there is this crosstalk between the peripheral metabolics as well as the central organ function being the brain. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can begin to think about genuinely novel, not, not hyperbole, but genuinely novel approaches to managing bipolar and depression. Some of this is futuristic. Some of this is actually going to be, we're using some of these strategies right now. So there's two ways. One is you can just develop a new drug through your 3D printer, right? Additive manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing, additive and subtractive manufacturing. You can just develop some new treatment with your, your, your scientists. The other way you can do this is by repurposing, taking treatments that already exist, and we have over 20,000 medicinal agents around the world, and repurposing them. So if, in fact, metabolism and inflammation are relevant to the lesion at the genetic, epigenetic, molecular, cellular circuit level, then maybe we can use this information to inform where we can go. And here's some examples. I've already been kind of showing my hands on a couple of these. A number of years ago, we did a study in bipolar disorder showing that if you deliver insulin through the nose, intranasally, you can improve cognition. And this has also been shown to improve cognition in mild cognitive impairment. Now, one other way you can improve insulin signaling is through aerobic exercise, losing weight. In fact, the most potent weight loss strategy is bariatric surgery, and bariatric surgery improves cognitive function via improvements in insulin signaling. Shouldn't it surprise us because insulin is so critical to cognition and reward in depression. Another study we did in major depression is more of a lesson for us in research, and that is, is that we showed it worked in major depression as well. But placebo worked really well in this group because cognition testing is associated with a practice effect. And the practice effect here was extraordinary. So we have leads that using an exogenous metabolic treatment could affect an outcome. Now, again, that's not the only way. You can do this through weight loss. You can do this through diet. You can do this through normal sleep chronobiology. You know, the best way to disrupt your insulin signaling is to disrupt your sleep. So that also can be beneficial. This is some data from Suzanne Kraft's group in um, Winston-Salem in the United States, in the Carolinas, showing that in MCI, mild cognitive impairment, that insulin administration can be beneficial for measures of cognition. I spoke earlier about how the connection circuitry in the brain is abnormal in diabetics. It's also the case in bipolar and depression. And I'll just make the point that when you administer insulin to a brain of a patient, not only do you see improvements in brain function, you also see an improvement in this connectivity, a resetting of that connectivity. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what subserves those research domain criteria, domains of cognition, reward, and threat. Now, remember I talked a bit about incretins. This is a treatment we use all the time in bipolar and depression, and I would encourage you to consider it. This is some data looking at animals that have been genetically modified to develop Alzheimer's disease. You can genetically uh, engineer these mice that they're at very high risk of manifesting uh, amyloid and Alzheimer's. And when you do that, and you give them liraglutide, which is Victoza, you reduce the deposition of amyloid as well as premature cell death, known as apoptosis. In other words, there's something about liraglutide, this incretin, that's slowing down the momentum towards the phenotype of Alzheimer's disease, at least at an animal model. And so a good colleague of mine, Gu Li, who's been working with us for the last two years, he's based in South Korea, but thanks to the internet of things, he's working very closely with us now even though he's moved back to South Korea. CUS stands for chronic unrestrained stress. Chronic unrestrained stress is bad news. That's what leads to health and disease problems. So people begin to have diabetes, obesity, depression, anxiety, they can't sleep, and so on. Interestingly enough, if you administer liraglutide, you reduce 
the immobility that's associated with chronic unrestrained stress. This is a model that's predictive of potential anhedonia enhancing effects or anti-anhedonia as well as procognition in antidepressant effects. So my foundation supported a study, the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation, where we wanted to determine whether an exogenous liraglutide incretin could improve cognition in bipolar and unipolar illness. And what we did was is we administered a variety of cognitive tests and we saw improvement in these non-diabetics taking this treatment. And every psychiatrist, every family doctor, every nurse, every PA knows that the problem in bipolar is depression, anhedonia, incognition. And those three targets were all mitigated by this intervention. Now, we also included magnet magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and we looked at some neurochemicals because we also had a mechanistic question we're trying to address. And we determined that just like ketamine, this drug, liraglutide, was affecting glutamate. By the way, on the issue of ketamine, I already was asked earlier this morning, early 2018, here in Mississauga, we're going to launch the Canadian Rapid Treatment Center of Excellence. It will be the largest infusion center in the nation offering ketamine and related treatments for depression and bipolar illness. We will be here in Mississauga at Mavis Road starting. We already have the, the clinic built. Staff is hired. We're just waiting for some of the paperwork to be done. It'll be opening, barring any unforeseen, Q1 2018. You're going to hear more about it. We're going to tell you more about it. On your tables, you have a sheet that's for the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation. And in addition to being on our mailing list for education activities, we can also contact you once the center is going to be open. It will be the biggest in the nation, and we're going to have a huge capability. And patients are going to, I think, really benefit from this. It's going to start Q1 2018, Mavis Road, Mississauga. Leave your information with Natasha, who was the individual who checked you in, signed you in when you showed up this morning at the front desk here. Just leave those with us, and we will contact you and give you more information about the center opening next year. Just one final point, because we, we, we like to, st you know, your threads have to stitch together. I said cognition improved. I said there were changes in glutamate. Now what I'm saying is, is that these things hang together. In other words, the correlation is there. That's not, you know, that's correlation between improvements in executive function and changes in glutamate. So in my clinic, I give Victoza 1.8 to 3 milligrams a day to many patients with unipolar bipolar illness to improve cognition, improve hedonism, improve depression. It causes weight loss, patients like that, but it also has this beneficial brain effect. Remember we talked about sirtuins? They're relevant to cellular aging, involve metabolism, inflammation. Well, you guys all know that the most, does anyone know, by the way, what the most potent anti-aging intervention there exists? And it's not oil of Olay. What's that? Growth hormone related, calorie restriction. Calorie restriction is the most potent way to reduce primary aging, which means aging just because of mother nature, and secondary aging, which is aging because you got screaming kids around the house, okay? So in other words, stress, okay? So caloric restriction is the most potent anti-aging intervention. So what are calorie restriction mimetics. How can we mimic this? Of course, you can't just not eat. So one way you can do it is give a drug. And resveratrol is the active moiety. It's a polyphenol that's in red wine. So I know some people are already thinking, I should just stop eating and just drink red wine for the rest of my life. <laughs> so resveratrol has been shown to upregulate the sirtuin which was reduced in a chronic stress model. Now, most of us are not going to tell our patients, go drink a gallon of red wine, a nice Malbec. But there's another drug you've heard of called metformin. And isn't it interesting that metformin is also an upregulator of sirtuins? But from the paradigm and the whole framework's perspective, 
is it not interesting, yet again, that a metabolic treatment is targeting a molecular system that is implicated as abnormal in bipolar and depression. That's why it's so interesting to take this mechanistic model and what can this tell us about new treatments, repurposing or genuinely new treatments. Resveratrol has also been shown, in fact, I think I have one more slide on that, yeah, to slow down the hippocampal volume reduction you see in mild cognitive impairment. Now, this study, I don't know these investigators, but they're working on a database in Taiwan. In my opinion, if I was asked the following question, what do you think in the last five years, the last 10 years, is the most important study in bipolar or depression? And I would say, I don't know, lots of good studies. I like to cite my own, but I can't. Um, what are the most important studies? This one's going to be one of the most important studies. And it got no airtime. No one cites it. It's a fantastic study. They show you could actually prevent bipolar disorder. Have you ever heard this before? So you all know diabetes is linked to a higher risk of depression and bipolar disorder. But they showed that if the diabetes is tightly controlled, the risk of brain consequence is minimized. Therefore, you don't have as much depression and bipolar illness. Now, I'm kind of doing some public relations for these people. I don't even know who these people even are. But the public relations I'm doing for them uh, may be in part overstating. I'm sure if they were here, they'd probably be a little embarrassed by what I'm saying. But they don't know what they've just did here. They've just shown a very interesting concept that if you can better treat a brain hazard known as metabolism, disturbance, diabetes, you could protect the brain. And we already know in, with other lines of research that better glycemic control reduces MCI and Alzheimer's disease. So when they're taking Coca-Cola machines out of public schools, everyone says, oh, this is great for the obesity epidemic. That's true. But it's also great for the brain disease epidemic. And no one talks about that because obesity and diabetes are brain hazards. And by the way, since people are frightened, thanks to Tom Cruise, to give kids antidepressants, the suicide rates has gone way up. It's very interesting. And we even have academic people in psychiatry who dislike our treatments and say they kill them too. So it's really a problem, and this is really, I think, important studies. Citagliptin, not to get too careful with this, I know we're, we're here for psychiatry, but we're also here to walk away with one or two pearls. I think that this is a very new way of trying to think about ways to treat anhedonia and cognition and depression. This is another metabolic treatment that's also been shown to have some beneficial effects on cognition. Let me summarize. We, in fact, need to do things very different. And the overlap of obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome in our patients is something we all know. We all know it carries baggage. We know it's determined by social, behavioral, biological, and iatrogenic factors. We all know that. And we all know that we should be avoiding it by optimizing treatments that don't carry that hazard. I've tried to take this conversation in a slightly different direction. What does this tell us about the mechanisms, about the disease? And not just because of, you know, academic cogitation, but what can this actually tell us in terms of taking us down a very different path? I've said nothing about anti-inflammatory treatments. We're doing a lot of work in that area. I try to focus on one just as the proof of principle area, that being metabolics. And from this, in the long term, or at least a little further out, there may be some treatments that we can engage, new or repurposed, that can target this, that can be genuinely new, possibly disease modifying, and maybe curative. At least that Walquist study from, from Taiwan gave us some very exciting thoughts around that. But also, I think in the clinical arena today, we already have some treatments that we can offer patients off-label that I think can help our patients. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>